Okay, everyone, I want to welcome you to tonight's program. My name is Pastor Marcy Scott Weiss, and uh, this is Magnolia United Church of Christ March Learning Forum. Tonight, we are brought to you by Humanities of Washington. We want to begin tonight by acknowledging that we represent, we present this program from the traditional lands of the Duwamish people. We ask those in attendance, wherever you may be, to reflect on the traditional lands that you inhabit to pay respect to the original stewards of those lands and to recognize their continuing connection to them. The presentation you're about to enjoy tonight is part of Humanities Washington Speakers Bureau program. That's a nonprofit organization dedicated to opening mind and bridging divides by creating spaces to explore different perspectives. I'll encourage you to visit their website to find other events like this. I'll put that link in the chat. They have amazing speakers and great learning opportunities beyond what you're going to hear tonight. A note on civil discourse. These programs are designed to generate open and honest conversations on a wide range of topics, some of which can be controversial. We encourage differing points of view. We ask you to treat this topic, the speaker, and each other with respect tonight. And please note that this event is being recorded. So a bit about our speaker this evening. Stephen Steer is a the Sam Reed Distinguished Professor in Civic Education and Public Civility at Washington State University. He earned his PhD in political science from the University of California, Berkeley. His work has been supported by the National Science Foundation, the National Research Council, National Academy of Science, and the Century Foundation. Professor Steer lives in Moscow, Idaho. Tonight, Stephen will be speaking for about 40 minutes, and then we will have time for questions. I'm going to ask that you all hold your questions until we finish the presentation part of the uh, evening evening's event. Now, that being said, feel free to use the chat if you want to start to get your questions in the queue. You're welcome to do that. If you have any issues with um, the presentation tonight, feel free to chat to me directly. I'll be monitoring that. Thank you so much for being here tonight, and thank you to Humanities of Washington for hosting this. I'm going to turn it over now to Dr. Stephen Steer. Thank you very much, Marcy, um, and welcome everybody um, out there. Um, in the time I've got allotted to me, I'm going to tell you a story. Um, if you're like me, uh, you've been trying to figure out what's going on in American politics uh, and how it got this way. Uh, because it's my job, I've been doing it a little bit longer, uh, but over the last 15 years or so, it's really become a, a, a project of mine to try to figure out how we got to this place, uh, which seems sort of unprecedented uh, in, our, in our civil society. You probably have your own uh, pet theories uh, about what's happened. And I'm gonna tell you my story of how I think we got to this place where a significant number of Americans are either angered or saddened uh, or confused, quite frankly, about how we got uh, how we got here. I always like to start uh, by uh, using a quotation uh, from somebody named Alexander Trenfor, who, by the way, uh, I can't find any evidence that that person ever existed, but I like the quote anyway. Um, but I like to use this quotation uh, because I, I'd like to emphasize I'm not here to try and indoctrinate anyone or make you believe uh, that my story is the only story uh, that can be told about American society and American politics. But um, uh, I'm going to try to show you some places where you can look uh, to kind of figure out uh, in your own way what's going on. Uh, I think it's really important to remember uh, that the history of the United States is really a history full of divisions. Uh, we were born as a country uh, out of tumult. Uh, in fact, historians have called the post-revolutionary war period 
They called it the age of passion. And one historian called it a decades long shouting match. Uh, what's interesting uh, is that, and here you see Jefferson and Hamilton who were on opposite sides of the divide in that time. But what they were arguing over are very, uh, very similar to the sorts of things that we're arguing about now uh, in our own politics, things like immigration, uh, tariffs, national security, and the proper role of government. Um, here we go. Um, if you think back to uh, events in American history, you'll remember this period ended uh, with a duel between the Vice President Aaron Burr and Alexander Hamilton, who succumbed uh, to his wounds after this duel. Uh, in the run-up to the Civil War, uh, we had uh, the caning of, uh, of a senator uh, by a representative uh, over the issue of slavery. We had a brawl and gunplay in the United States Congress. And of course, this all ran up to uh, the actual Civil War. Um, and so um, the, the country's always been uh, driven by uh, certain divisions. Um, so what, what makes me think that American politics is boiling over? I mean, besides the fact that uh, just on an intuitive level, it seems to be the case, but there's some other uh, uh, evidence of dysfunction, I think. Um, we're seeing levels of partisan polarization among particularly political leaders uh, that hasn't been seen since that Civil War period. Um, we're also seeing high levels of incivility, uh, a particular interest of mine, um, and increasing political violence, uh, which is related. Um, we see policymaking, especially in Washington and gridlock, uh, where Congress is unable to address even basic national issues. Uh, we're seeing increases in deaths of despair. Uh, deaths of despair are deaths from uh, suicide, uh, alcoholism, and uh, overdoses of, of opioids. Um, and so we're seeing people uh, giving up. Um, we can't agree on even basic facts. And some people are calling us a post-truth society uh, where everybody has their own truth. Um, going along with this, there's widespread beliefs and conspiracy theories. Um, and most lately, uh, there's been a serious attempt to overturn the results of a presidential election uh, based on a lie that it was stolen. Um, so how did we get here? Uh, like I said, it's complicated. You gotta connect a lot of dots. Uh, people tend to focus on one thing or another. And I think there's a lot of different things that have kind of built up over the last maybe 60 uh, years or so uh, that have led us to uh, the place where we are now. It hasn't just happened in the last five or six years. Um, one thing I wanna emphasize is that, you know, you know, people talk about populism and there've been a number of populist movements uh, throughout American history on both the left wing and the right wing of American politics. Um, What's interesting though, is left-wing populism uh, tends to be the so-called ordinary people against those uh, in the elite establishment. Um, and then right-wing populism uh, has that same feature of the ordinary people uh, versus the elite establishment, but uh, they have an added dimension of antipathy towards quote unquote outsiders. And this is typically immigrants. And we've seen this uh, throughout American history whenever populism is on the rise as it seems to be uh, right now, at least on the right. Um, this happens when, uh, populism happens when American society is undergoing some destabilizing changes. I've talked to a number of historian friends of mine um, and a lot of them believe that we are um, in a position where we're, I'm having trouble advancing my slides here. Uh, we are in some ways reliving uh, the so-called Gilded Age, 
uh, which took place uh, from the 1870s to the 1920s. And if you look at some of the features of that time period, uh, wealth inequality, income inequality, racial and class divisions, religious divisions, technological change, uh, political violence, white nationalism, uh, the changing composition of the electorate. All of these things were going on uh, back then that are also going on right now. And these things tend to destabilize society and cause people to uh, lose trust in societal institutions and become sort of unmoored uh, from uh, old patterns. Uh, it also, at that time, resulted in the same things that we're seeing now, uh, partisan polarization, very close elections, divided government where Congress goes back and forth between Republicans and Democrats. And we also see um, uh, increase in beliefs in conspiracy theories, just as we're seeing uh, now. Um, bringing it more up to date, I think the contemporary story <clears throat> of American politics really begins at the conclusion of World War II. Um, and that poses the question, you know, some people look back uh, on this interwar period, the post-World War II period, as being a period of bipartisanship and civility. Uh, another way of looking at it, though, uh, is was this a period when there was an illusion of consensus? And the reason I say that is that uh, many voices uh, were stifled, quite frankly, uh, during this period. If you were a straight white male, uh, it probably was a period of, of good times, but there were a lot of voices that weren't being heard. And I think this, this period of, uh, of the illusion of consensus was also driven by the fact that uh, the Cold War created a common enemy, uh, communism. So there was a common threat uh, very, very strong economic growth uh, that raised a lot of boats, including those with limited education, uh, where you could get a good job and provide for your family. And then also at that time, uh, Southern conservatives from the Democratic Party in Congress were able to block things like civil rights, health care, and, and, and silencing any sort of identity groups. Well, of course, this all uh, broke free uh, in the 1960s, uh, when uh, we had demonstrations against the Vietnam War and in favor of civil rights. We had women's rights and gay rights, uh, also consumer rights. Uh, this was an era of social change. Uh, many of you may have lived through this period like I did. And so you know what I'm, you know what I'm talking about. Uh, the decade of the 70s that followed, uh, of course, was... Uh, not a particularly happy time. <laughs> well, we, had, uh, we had the Arab oil embargo and the ensuing energy crisis in 1973. Uh, we had the Watergate scandal, and of course, Nixon resigns. And then he gets pardoned, which is part of the story. Seems like if you're connected and part of the elite, you get away with things. We, of course, def were defeated in Vietnam. Uh, uh, we had stagflation at this time, something economists didn't think could happen, uh, meaning we had both inflation and stagnant growth at the same time. And then something that's a little more wonky, um, we begin to see presidents of both parties embracing uh, neoliberal economic policies. And so instead of using a Keynesian approach, uh, which essentially says get money in the hands of the consumers, and they'll buy things, uh, we moved to a trickle down approach, which said, okay, give tax breaks to the wealthy and that'll trickle down to the rest of us, uh, which hasn't proven uh, to be true. And I think that's part of uh, the sort of economic part of the story that I'm trying to tell here. Uh, you can see uh, that before this period in the early 60s, uh, people overwhelmingly trusted uh, the federal government uh, to do the right thing most of the time. Uh, and then during this, this period I'm talking about, uh, it went down precipitously um, and it's still kind of going down with a few humps and bumps uh, based on 
episode, episodic historical events. And so it's pretty clear that the American people have lost faith in uh, the federal government to do the right thing. And, and perhaps with good reason, um, at least a number of the programs uh, that they've engaged with since the Great Society um, are arguably uh, not being successful. Um, a lot of people like to point uh, at the rise of cable news, and I think that's part of the story as well. Uh, CNN, of course, uh, was created in 1980 and then Fox in 96. Uh, we also had the end of the Fairness Doctrine, uh, which led to the rise of talk radio, uh, which was overwhelmingly, has been overwhelmingly uh, a uh, channel that the uh, right wing has been using. Uh, social media platforms further fragment the consumption of political news. Overwhelmingly, young people get political news uh, from their social media feeds, which is probably not a great source of uh, accurate political information. Um, I think uh, Newt Gingrich, uh, who was uh, elected Speaker of the House in 1995, uh, has played an overarching role in all of this, especially as it relates to civility, uh, because he used uh, incivility as a strategy. And I think a number of our politicians are still using incivility as a strategy uh, because it attracts votes, uh, it attracts media attention. And so, uh, so I think Newt Gingrich uh, certainly uh, should be featured in this story. Uh, of course, then we have the, uh, the uh, international terrorism attacks of 9-11, uh, which of course ushered in a, a war on terror a recent book by uh, Spencer Ackerman um, talks about how 9-11 uh, uh, destabilized America, um, partly because uh, it was driven by a perception of, again, non-whites, outsiders, uh, as marauders, even conquerors from hostile foreign civilizations. And of course, the election of Barack Obama in 2008 united this war on terror and the culture war uh, in the minds of some people who believe that Obama was a secret Muslim. Um, and so this war on terror, again, adds more um, fuel to the destabilization. Uh, of course, we have the financial crisis, the Great Recession of uh, about 15 years ago. Um, and what's interesting is that, again, uh, we see a president, this time a Democrat, showing deference uh, to the elite banks instead of bailing out homeowners, uh, bailing out Wall Street and the market. And so, again, people have reason to believe that uh, you can be too big to fail and that uh, the small timers uh, just have to... Uh, uh, to, uh, to take what they get. Um, this led, uh, this recession led directly uh, to the Tea Party uh, on, the, on the right, uh, which of course is still with us in various vestiges, uh, leading to this rightward drift uh, in the uh, Republican Party. And you can see from their signs uh, that I picked here, uh, it's again, um, looking both upward to the elites and being mad and looking downward uh, at, the, uh, at the outsiders uh, as being to blame. <clears throat> On the left, we had Occupy Wall Street, uh, which again was a more of a left-wing populist uh, approach of just looking upward, uh, calling themselves the 99%. Um, and then this ended, of course, not ended, but it ultimately uh, helped elect Donald Trump in 2016. Now, I don't think he uh, did anything more than harness these, this anger that has been building, particularly among those who believe that they're being squeezed by both uh, the elites above them and by uh, people uh, below them, as they think, in the social system. Uh, things like immigrants and those that uh, are maybe on welfare or whatever. Um, 
but he portrayed himself as the sort of ultimate outsider who would come in and fix uh, both uh, the elites and those uh, who were uh, in the minds of some cutting the line. Um, and so he just kind of harnessed uh, the moment, I, I think. Um, of course, um, this has turned to talk uh, about a civil war. Um, I think based on everything that I've read, uh, a civil war in these times would look a lot different uh, than the civil war in the 19th century. Uh, it would be more like episodic uh, violence um, and more uh, almost guerrilla type uh, tactics or cyber warfare, things like that. Um, so um, I don't know how, um, how that will turn out. But anyway, uh, and then most recently, I think uh, we see the assault on the U.S. Capitol uh, as a sort of a culmination uh, I hope, hopefully, a culmination in the in the uh, political violence that we've been seeing. So, anyway, I think what we're seeing here is uh, a battle between competing belief systems. Uh, I probably should drop the word political because it really goes deeper than that. It, it's almost um, different worldviews uh, that have to do with much more than politics. Uh, on an economic level, on a social level, on almost every level. Um, and there's plenty of evidence that uh, people who are very extreme in their views see the other side as literally a, uh, a threat to their existence, an existential threat uh, to their existence. Um, so how do we get so tribal? Well, part of it is, um, we know from political psychology that identity-based conflict uh, increases when we li are living in stressful times. And I think we certainly are living in stressful times. And we see both in-group security, that is to say, coming together with people like you increases, but even more importantly, uh, out-group out -group antipathy uh, increases. Uh, in fact, there's plenty of surveys that show uh, people who are very partisan aren't so much in love with their own party, but they really hate the other side. And this is what we call effective polarization. It's not issue-based. It's based on uh, who the other side, uh, what, who they belong with. Um, and certainly, I think partisan leaders and the media have found that conflict and incivility are strategically useful. Uh, media finds that they get much higher ratings uh, when they're showing conflict and, and shouting matches. And certainly partisan leaders, uh, until they're proven otherwise, uh, are going to keep using civility, incivility as a, as a tool. And then the social media, I think, just amplifies. It makes it easier for these messages uh, to, to get out. Uh, there was an interesting article, it'll, it'll be a couple of summers ago now, by George Packer in The Atlantic uh, that I think is really instructive with respect to um, the fractures in, in, American, uh, in American politics. Uh, he divides up Americans into, into four different kinds of groups, and he gives them each a name. Uh, and I'll use his names. Uh, he calls one group Free America. Uh, these are the folks that I would call the old style Republicans, uh, the center right orientation. And they believe in freedom from regulation, individualism, small government, fiscal restraint. You know, I would think Mitt Romney would be sort of the poster uh, man for that group. Uh, on the other side, we have a center left orientation. He calls these people smart America. These are the urban and suburban folks, high levels of education, often knowledge workers. Uh, they don't care about globalization. They believe globalism is good. And so Hillary Clinton is probably the uh, sort of face of this, of this orientation. 
Uh, I think driving uh, the incivility and the rage in our politics is really these other two Americas. He calls one group, this group real America. These folks are rural and predominantly white. They have lower education levels, often uh, just a high school education. Uh, they tend to be evangelical Christians. They're anti-elite, they're anti-immigrant, uh, just like I pointed out about right-wing populism. They tend to be very nationalist. Uh, their narrative is of grievance and resentment. Uh, they've been watching all these events unfold over time that I've been pointing out, and they're angry about. Uh, they believe that they're being unfairly cut out somehow, both culturally and somewhat economically, but even more so culturally. Uh, these are the folks who don't want us to advance into a more progressive world that's multicultural, more accepting of different viewpoints. Uh, they want things the way they were or the way they believe that they were. And then on the other side, we have what Packer calls just America. Uh, these are mostly urban. Many of them are members of minority groups, uh, often trafficking in identity politics. And their main uh, focus is seeking justice. And these are the folks who uh, use narratives of oppression. They believe that American society has too long uh, marginalized them and they're seeking their place at the table. And I think the real America and just America are the two groups that are really sort of driving uh, the problems while the people sort of in the middle are more horrified, I think, by, by what's going on. Uh, there've been a number of books, you may have read some of these, uh, both on about the left and the right uh, by some very respected scholars. Uh, and so I recommend, uh, if you haven't read them, uh, you might want to go to your library or wherever and, and pick them up. Um, there are some other trends and changes, I think, that have been amplifying these culture wars. Um, we are apparently sorting ourselves demographically uh, into uh, more and more like-minded areas. People want to congregate with those who are more politically and socially like them. Um, and certainly we're seeing a widening of the urban-rural uh, divide in America. Um, we're also seeing, of course, uh, income inequality and wage stagnation, which again adds more anger uh, that the rich are getting richer while the poor are getting poorer. Uh, I've already pointed out the lack of trust in government, but it goes beyond just government. It's all societal institutions uh, are being uh, distrusted now. Um, I pointed out intense dislike of members of the other political party. And then of course, well, uh, and then of course a pandemic that uh, adds just more um, um, more destabilization. Just to give you an idea of how trusting institutions on all levels have been going down since uh, the early or early 80s, you can see um, that every major institution has lost uh, uh, lost standing with the people. Uh, I was pointing out the big sort. Uh, this is a map that uh, shows you. Uh, counties in presidential elections that went by 20% uh, or more to one candidate or another. And you can see the reds are Republican, the blues are Democratic counties. Uh, and you can see with the exception of the sort of Intermountain West there, um, that even in 1996, there were relatively few uh, landslide counties. And then increasingly, uh, we see more and more counties in presidential elections being decided by 20 points or more, which is actually pretty dramatic, actually, uh, historically speaking. Here are landslide counties in the 2020 election. Uh, you can see the map is overwhelmingly red, indicating that Donald Trump won many counties uh, by more than 20 points. Uh, in fact, 
Uh, Joe Biden won the presidency uh, by winning only 420 counties, but they were the big counties uh, and strategically in the right places to win the electoral college. Uh, but Donald Trump won over, uh, over 2,700 counties uh, just because they're, they're smaller in, in population. But the main point is we are increasingly sorted into our own uh, communities where we only hear uh, things that we already uh, probably believe. Uh, and so we're not getting a whole a lot of exposure to other, uh, other viewpoints. Uh, turns out that this uh, idea of, of instability in US politics and society has been studied by a guy named Peter Turchin and he points out uh, that there seems to be a cyclical nature of this instability. Um, and he looks at the following factors. And again, uh, I would invite you to think about where we are uh, currently in American politics. Um, his index where he uh, decides uh, when a society is unstable, um, is there fiscal distress in the government? Um, are there increasing deficits in public debt? Well, certainly in the US, that's true. Uh, individual fiscal distress. Uh, wages have been stagnant in the United States uh, since the 1970s uh, when you uh, control for um, when you control for inflation. Um, backlash against globalization and multiculturalism, uh, which we're also seeing, of course, in other uh, Western South countries. Uh, fears regarding uh, terrorism and immigration, uh, distrust in institutions, which I pointed out. And then finally, like I said, a public health crisis. And these all add more, uh, more stress uh, to American society, which I think you know, has been sort of unleashed uh, in the anger and uh, confusion and, and so forth. Um, the uh, Peter Turchin did a, um, uh, a uh, political stress index uh, looking at uh, the US uh, over the time period uh, from 1960 to 2010. And you can see beginning uh, really about 1980, which is the period I'm kind of talking about, we see the upward turn and a real steep turn in 2000. He uh, did the same analysis <laughs> in the buildup to the Civil War. Uh, and you can see that the curves between modern America and the Civil War buildup uh, are frighteningly similar, at least in Turchin's, uh, Turchin's mind. Uh, and so um, he sees this uh, time period as not quite reaching a, uh, a peak instability yet. So uh, what does the future hold? Uh, well, I'm terrible at predicting the future. Uh, so I just want to throw a few questions maybe out there uh, to think about. Uh, one, what are the prospects for changing institutions? For example, maybe uh, adding more parties uh, to the two-party system to represent more accurately the fractured America. Uh, well, the way our electoral systems are set up, uh, that would be very difficult. Uh, third parties uh, run up against all sorts of institutional problems. Uh, and remember, our, our electoral system is highly decentralized. It's run by the states and local governments, uh, not completely by the federal government. Uh, other institutional changes that have been talked about is getting rid of the Electoral College, uh, which certainly uh, favors small state uh, states that have two senators regardless of their population, uh, which leads frankly to uh, minority rule. Uh, we've had uh, seven of the last uh, presidents, uh, well, two of the last Republican presidents uh, have not won um, a um, popular vote. Uh, in fact, the only popular vote in the last 20 years run by a Republican is George W. Bush in 2004. Um, Will some focusing of that uh, bring the American people together? I was kind of hoping that a pandemic would do it. At the beginning of 2020, when, uh, when we started getting more and more news about 
COVID, uh, I was thinking, gee, maybe this will bring us together. And of course, that didn't happen. In fact, it was used as a wedge uh, to drive us even further apart. Um, there's some evidence that younger people uh, are getting fed up. Uh, the question is, are they going to just turn off the of politics or are they going to uh, try to make a change? And so there's a possibility that a generational change uh, might be able to take place. I think the, the easiest path um, would be to have voters start punishing elected officials who stoke the fires of the culture war. If they start losing elections, uh, politicians are not stupid. They will take note and they'll change their behavior accordingly. In fact, in Utah, during the 2020 gubernatorial election, something really astounding happened. The Republican candidate and the Democratic candidate did a joint video campaign ad where they implored uh, their supporters on both sides to, you know, we're fine if you disagree with the other side, but be civil about it. Uh, don't, you know, take anger out on the other side, but let's, uh, let's, let's do this in a civil way. And I think things like that will model uh, good behavior. Um, and then finally, I think, will problems become so pressing, I'm thinking here global climate change, that our politics become issue-based again. Uh, until the, uh, really over the last 40 years, uh, we used to argue about issues, and that's not happening anymore. We're arguing about uh, culture uh, and not about, uh, not about issues so much. Um, finally, I guess, uh, we could just be living through another period where uh, American society is sort of returning back uh, to the tumult of the post-revolutionary war uh, period. So anyway, with that, I want to thank you and see if you have any, uh, any questions for me. Hey, Stephen, could we start by you returning to your book slide? There's been some requests for those books that you had on. If we could see those with a little pause Oops. over there. Yep, so folks could write those down. A lot of interest in that. Here, I, I saw it. It was a blur. It went by, but it was there. OK. So after this. There we go. There you go. That's the one people are looking for. Okay. If folks could just have a moment to write those down. Sure. And um, so the first question that showed up in the chat is one that you've already um, addressed to some degree, but um, the question is, it would it be helpful if we had multi-party system? Like it would be. I think it would be. I think one positive move in that direction. I mean, without. Um, going to a multi-party system is I think ranked choice voting, which they're using in Alaska now, uh, is sort of an intermediate step uh, because it gives people an opportunity not to just pick one or the other, uh, but to also send a message about, okay, who's in second uh, in, my, in my pecking order. Um, but certainly I think, um, it would tamp down um, you know, some of the effective polarization if we had some parties representing that more middle ground that I was talking about. And the question actually referenced uh, Europe in particular. As, as you um, went through all of the contributing factors that you talked about, um, how, how are you seeing this play out in Europe? Some of the same uh, sorts of factors that are leading to our uh, issues are, uh, especially with, as it relates to populist movements, uh, is happening in Britain, it's happening in France, it's happening in Italy, uh, to a lesser extent in Germany, it's happening in Hungary, and it's being caused by some of the same, <clears throat> some of this, the same things, uh, fear of immigration, 
fears that people are cutting the line uh, on them. Uh, and it's having some of the same uh, electoral consequences with people getting elected. But one of the things that parliamentary, uh, parliamentary governments have is they do have multiple parties. And so the fact that you know, a right-wing uh, group can capture the parliament in Great Britain uh, doesn't mean uh, that uh, they're completely in charge of, uh, of government. Uh, they still have to deal with the other, with the other parties. So I was on mute. The next one that has come in said, it's a long one. I'd like to hear more about climate change. It is still an afterthought in discussions about the state of the country. The UN released a report that that catastrophe is on its way in the 2030s unless we take more aggressive actions. Climate change doesn't care about politics. Unfortunately, we don't have much luxury to let time take its course. I see it being overlooked by all four groups of Americans. Um, I would disagree with a little bit of that. Uh, if you look at surveys, um, we know that people who are partisan on the Democratic side are much more likely to think climate change is happening right now uh, and to prioritize it as something we need to do something about right now. Um, we're seeing a little bit of movement on the Republican side. Uh, there's been a slight uptick uh, recently in belief that it's happening, uh, but still not much appetite for doing anything about it. Um, you know, one thing that I kind of left out of the story because it kind of gets into the institutional weeds a little bit is our political system because of the two senator rule, which I did mention, um, means that minorities um, are have over uh, are overrepresented. You know, I know 60% of American people would like to do something about uh, climate change, but uh, the Senate uh, is sort of a roadblock uh, to, to that. Uh, on the positive side, I do teach environmental policy, uh, and there's been some recent uh, studies that have shown that, um, you know, because of advances in things like LED light bulbs, uh, we're reducing our consumption of, of electricity. Uh, there's been a big increase in uh, people buying um, electrical ve electric vehicles. And so there's some evidence that it's not quite as dire as even the UN report that came out today is saying. I'm not saying that we shouldn't do something about it, but um, um, yeah, the politics are still tricky uh, for, uh, for, the, for the United States. Hey, Stephen, here's a question. I, I will tell you, I had the same question when I saw the graph of the, um, the, that put us next to the Civil War that had the same curve. The question is, do you see any limits on anger and extremism without sliding into some kind of a war? The voters turning against extremism like you suggested, anything else? Well, I really think that people who are going to be prone to violence uh, are really more at the extreme, uh, which isn't okay, but I don't see any evidence beyond, you know, these episodic militia groups uh, of them taking up arms in a widespread sort of way where the army has to be called out. I mean, that's the thing that really makes uh, civil wars go is if one side is, is in control of the military um, and that hasn't happened at this point. And so I think if there is a, I don't know, it'd be more like what we saw, I think on, on, on January 6th of 2021, uh, where it was certainly a, a sad day, uh, but it was more geographically contained and again, it's it's not okay to have people uh, trying to uh, blow up uh, electrical substations to cut power to people uh, or to do other other types of violence. But I don't think we've seen to seen it get to the point yet where 
uh, that violence is widespread. I mean, many of our people will say that we may have to use violence uh, to protect American democracy, then will actually use violence. Okay, thank you. And I, uh, oh, go ahead, Stephen. I think that graph from Peter Turchin uh, is more demonstrative of how, um, again, the, the, this idea that society has become destabilized uh, in, in a very similar way that it was just before the Civil War. Although I'm not saying that certainly we're not like it was in the 1860s at this point. Thank you. Uh, I think uh, um, part of what John's asking is also what Roger's asking, which is what will help here, right? And you've talked about voting, uh, letting the votes count. And Roger also has a question, I think, tongue in cheek about Sunday school being mandatory. But what is the role of education in this? Uh, that's tricky uh, because we're seeing, um, unfortunately, a backlash against education. You know, what's happening, and actually this is a part of a project that I'm a, a part of on seeing to what extent what's happening nationally uh, is trickling down to the state and ultimately to school boards, to uh, community college boards, uh, to county commissioners and things of that sort. We're seeing some of the same, you know, sorts of behavior. And again, I think punishing people who uh, engage in that kind of behavior is a is a good way of of uh, of snuffing that out. Um, so really, it kind of points to individual level behavior. Um, there's also a lot of studies out there that really make getting getting civility back in our politics. Uh, a bit, a very complicated psychological uh, sort of experiment that isn't really scalable uh, to the mass public. Okay, I'm going to put out a call for any additional questions. And um, and Stephen, I, I I am going to challenge you to see if you can um, either give us three things that you feel like we could do to help turn the tide as individuals. And, and at the same time, also tell us, uh, kind of find the hope in this. Where, where is the silver lining? I do believe there is one in every situation. So I would challenge you on both of those things. Could you give us three things that we could do to help turn the tide? And where do you find hope or um, a silver lining in all of this? Well, I think the number one thing is that you need to be kind to each other, even people who you disagree with. Uh, I don't know to what extent uh, folks in your congregation uh, know a lot of people, uh, whatever side they're on, if they know people from the other side. And if they, if they try to understand where they're coming from. Um, personally, um, even though I'm kind of cocooned in the university, I do know a number of people. Uh, in, in fact, Sam Reed, uh, who uh, provided the uh, funding for the professorship that I occupy, is a Republican. Uh, and Sam and I disagree about issues, but we don't disagree about civility. Um, and, and, and how to be understanding of, of other people's views. Uh, I think second, um, kind of lost my train of thought here. Um, well, second, I think modeling good behavior um, so that the children learn and you know, other people will maybe mimic your, uh, your behavior. Um, and I thought of a third thing. Oh, uh, what gives me hope? Um, it turns out, um, and I've lived a long time, as you can see from my hair, <laughs> um, people are pretty resilient. And, you know, I've, I've done my best to try to do back of the envelope calculations of how many people are really part of what I would call the problem. 
people at the very tails of the extremes. And I like to think that it's a relatively few, but they have loud voices. Uh, they're the ones who you see on Facebook and all the other social media sites that I don't know anything about. And so I think the, um, the center might hold, uh, and that's my hope. Thank you for that. I think that is a beautiful way to end this tonight. I really appreciate all the wisdom that you so graciously shared tonight, Stephen. Very much so. Well, I, I hope you found it. I hope you found it interesting. Yes, it was excellent. Thank you so much. Thank you to everybody who joined us tonight, and thank you to Humanities of Washington for uh, providing the grant for this. And again, thank you, Stephen. Good night, You're everyone. Welcome. Thank you, Marcy. Thank, thank you, everybody. Thank you.